You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello, welcome to Garibaldi Red and welcome to the first of our World Cup specials as we catch up with Nottingham Reds fans, former players and coaches over the next few weeks during the World Cup in Qatar. And I'm delighted we're kicking off with a returning favourite in Reds fan, comedian and podcaster Matt Ford. Matt, hello, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm all right. I've started writing down the intros to these podcasts. I'm not sure it's a good idea. Okay. Whether should, should you wing it as a, a, in these podcasts or not? Well, it's whatever sounds best, I think. I think if you listen back to it and when you wing it, you think, oh, that didn't sound quite as good. Having something written can help. But who am I? <laughs> who am I to give advice to anyone on anything? I'm a bit of a bumbling talker. So, um, right. Obviously... We are, as we record this, we're between the Palace and the Brentford games. I think we've got a pretty good idea of how the season's shaping up. How are you finding it? A living hell or are you enjoying every moment or somewhere in the middle? I'm still, um, obviously I don't want us to get relegated. And the problem is, is that (laughs) you're like, what do you think there's only one game left before the World Cup? Oh God. Because until now you're like, I would bother, but you know, it's basically fine. Because uh, we're within touching distance and all the things that you tell yourself when you're bottom of the league. And now you're like, oh, God. Oh, is it, if, if this is the halfway mark or approaching it, uh, we might get relegated. And that's uh, that's rubbish, obviously. So until now, I've been... To be honest, I'm still quite enjoying it. I just, I'm just so pleased that we're in the Premier League. I still get a real buzz out of the fact we're on match of the day, that we're scoring goals, that we're often leading games. Uh, and it it doesn't feel maybe I'm just terribly naive. It doesn't feel like perilous yet. Obviously, we need to get the hell out of the bottom three, but it doesn't feel like uh, it, we've lost. You know, we're at a touching distance, or, or that somehow we're having a terror. It doesn't feel. What's mad is to me in my mind, it doesn't feel like a terrible season. Do you know what I mean? Like so much of it is really enjoyable. The atmosphere at the City Ground is incredible. Beating Liverpool was great. Beating West Ham was great. Should have beaten Brentford. You know, we're always going to get tonked by Arsenal and City. So you're like, actually, overall, it's, I, I'm still really enjoying it. Is that mad? Yeah. No, because I think it's been a season where there's been terrible games, but only a couple that have really like slanted the way it feels. So obviously the Bournemouth collapse really hurt. And then yeah. Leicester was really bad. I know you're at the Arsenal game. I listened to your Comedians Play FPL podcast. That's the only game where I got annoyed. I got annoyed at Leicester because they were just wide open, but I thought in the second half against Arsenal, they didn't put their lot in. Was it? Did you uh, did you still enjoy that in the ground, or did you get that feeling like, come on, this isn't good enough, even if it's Arsenal? It's very difficult. It, 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 at various points in the game, I felt both things. Uh, I was just so, stood there at the Emirates thinking, we're back. We're playing... Uh, now, obviously... When you're five nil down at the Emirates, it's kind of less of a less of a joy. But there's still part of it because I've waited for this for so long to see us at these sorts of stadiums. That said, we just weren't in it at all that day, and it's very disappointing. I mean, I'm not. I'm a fan, so I know. I basically. Whatever they say on match of the day, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should have come across that run. <laughs> At the time, I'm like, I didn't see it. Do you know what I mean? I'm just following the ball like a child. So I understand what pundits say about us. When you watch stuff back, you're like, fine. And on the day, you felt that we're playing very deep behind the ball and all the rest of it. But then what other alternative did we really have? We were more open. We might have lost 9-0. So I don't know. I think it's really difficult. I... I, 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 I a mixed feelings, really, because at times I think Morgan Gibbs White looks great. I think Nico Williams looks great. Yates is great. Dean Henderson is incredible. See, so like this, we've got some phenomenal players, and at times we are brilliant to watch, and at times we look like we're totally dominant. And it, but it just never feels like when we're ahead that we've killed a game off. It never really feels like that's it. And probably the Bournemouth game is the one where you're like, oh my god, that's the ultimate example. But. So, uh, just a mix of things, really. Um, but yes, the Arsenal game at the time, I was like, I went into that stadium. Although at half time, I was, you know, like a fool. You go, I reckon we might get a draw out right of this. Yeah, we're doing all right, aren't we? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> Ten minutes later, you're 3 0 down. You think, what was I thinking? But it, I don't know. Do you know what, as well? I just, 
I just think the manager's great, and I think there's so much about the club that's great that pff, there's only so much. I mean, we can't really control anything as fans, so then you, we have to hand it over to them and, and just enjoy uh, maybe not all aspects of the process, but certainly enjoy the days out. And, and, and I kind of consume it on that level. I'm just so pleased we're in the Premier League. And then obviously, I don't want us to not be in the Premier League. So now I'm like, oh man, I don't want it to just be one year. So the, the, the negative thoughts haven't come in too much at the moment. I'm, I'm, I still am, am uh, in a way, against the evidence, very positive. No, I think I am as well. I think the last six games have given plenty more cause for optimism. We recorded yesterday as. Um, this is going to go out in a week or so, but with Darren Fletcher and Greg Mitchell talking about the Palace game, and it's not a must win. It feels like they're not going to be adrift and they just need to keep chipping away. And I mean, obviously, there's lows, there's going to be highs and lows, but if you, if Forest are going to stay up, does it feel like it's going to be one of those last day dramas where we're all either in tears of joy or tears of despair at the end? Yeah. I think it is. I mean, the, the other thing is, other teams will fall away and, and, and get dragged into a relegation fight. We did beat Liverpool the other week. Mm. So it's not terrible. And it is a bit chaotic. And it was always going to be a bit chaotic, given the circumstances that, obviously, you talk about a lot on this podcast. But, um, I, I mean, ultimately, can we get out of it? And I think everyone thinks we can. And do we have the manager to get us out of it? I think the vast majority of people think we do. And and I'm not saying the answer to having too many players is more players. But <laughs> in January, obviously, there's an option to change things again. So I, th- I think we'll do it. I think we'll do it. And you know what? Even if we don't, even if we go down, part of me thinks, well, then we'll probably come back up fairly soon. It was the length of the wait before that drove us all m- mad. Whereas now I think we've we still moved, as a club, we've just massively moved on. And as a team already this season, beating Liverpool, get the, I mean, you know, the, obviously the Arsenal game is just awful. Um, and we're going to have a few of those, like you say, City and obviously Leicester. But uh, the other games have been, I mean, we were just really, un, I mean, ah. do you know what? I really hate the chant. We always get shit refs. I hate that. I, I, I just like <laughs> we're not uniquely badly served, but uh, that re- the referee at the weekend was terrible. And you just think, I know it kind of evens out over the course of a season, but when you're at the bottom, it you feel it so much more. Uh, so the, you know, luck plays a part as well. What's your take on VAR in the ground and watching on TV? They're two different things, aren't they? Is do you find it awful or are you one of these few people that might find it adds a bit of drama to the another layer to the drama that already exists? It definitely adds another layer. It, it also takes, depending, you know, in some scenarios it adds, in other scenarios it takes away. If you've just conceded a goal, you're mm. begging for VAR. So then it's euphoric if something gets chalked off. When it's the other way, it's a nightmare because it kills the moment. And then you're waiting. And then when it's confirmed, it's never as euphoric as actually seeing the goal happen in the first place. Um, but this is the problem with... and it, People for years were going... Now, I agree with goal line technology. Like, if it's a goal or not, it's fundamental. That's the whole purpose of the game itself. So whether it's cross the line or not, I agree with using goal line technology. But... With VAR, I remember for years people who follow rugby and stuff going, oh, well, football doesn't have VAR, everyone has VAR. You're like, but this idea that sticking cameras on it, having watched a lot of football on telly, where Sky Sports have had HD cameras at these grounds for 20 years, 30 years, and they still are arguing about it for five hours after the game is finished. And I will watch them argue about it for five hours afterwards, because watching them argue for it about it for five hours is very good telly. The idea that this was going to solve all the problems and like a, never mis- a mistake would never be made again. There are still human beings at Stockley Park Mm. ultimately making decisions. And you saw how VAR was used differently in tournaments to how it was used domestically in the Premier League. And I think they've learned from that and it's more light touch this season. But still, it depends what shot you show the referee. And I I think sometimes showing it in slow motion isn't correct. And sometimes you, you, you just, when you're watching what the referee's watching, you're watching just this gif. And you're like, I can't make, I can't tell what's going on now. And sometimes it may, you know, from some angles, you're like, well, it's definitely not. And then from another angle, it definitely is. So human beings are still, there's still effectively a referee in Stockley Park saying, this is the shot I think is the priority. I just think 
I don't know. I, I'm not n- necessarily against it. I just think, and I never thought it would solve problems in, in, in a way. Of course it can't because it's still, unless you start using AI and if, <laughs> <laughs> I think if we've got AI, we've got, AI's probably got bigger fish to fry than whether Dean Anderson should have uh, conceded a penalty uh, to Brentford. But it's always, it, you can't have, it, it's always going to be imperfect because people are involved and people cheat what's contact and, and even when the rules are clear there's still a, an element of discretion and and that means sadly that as a club who's at the lower end of the table you're always wary that your g- decisions are less likely to go your way than they are for teams at the top and i think that's something that frustrates people with var is how does city get something and we don't stuff like that but <sighs> I'd have less of it, to be honest, because it does ruin those big moments. I'd have goal line technology and VAR for... The problem is, when it's your, when you're the team that's going to benefit from it, you're screaming for it. Mm. And I, I, how do you undo that? I think we're stuck with it now. Yeah, I mean, you don't have Graeme Souness and Roy Keane in the studio on Sky Sports going, oh, now I've seen that footage. We can both agree and shake hands on this. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think I got that wrong. Yeah, I'm so sorry, yeah. Roy. Equally, yeah. football is entertainment. And one thing that I do love about football is just the endless drama, whether it's Conti at the weekend slapping a ball out of someone's hand or whatever. And the whole thing of like, they're going to check the monitor has added an entertainment value where you're like, oh my God. So in games, I would say if you're watching a game, well, when it's your team, you just want them to win no matter what. Just win one nil, I don't care how we do it. If you're just watching like Super Sunday, like Spurs Liverpool at the weekend. You're like, I want to see end-to-end action. I want to see loads of goals, yellow cards, red cards, managers getting sent off. And in that circus element of football, VAR is great entertainment. When they go to the screen, you're like, oh my God, he's looking at the screen. It has added, even though it drives me mad, I can't deny that if I'm watching the game and they go to the monitor, I'm like, oh. And it's like, it's brought in a way that studio element onto the bit, which is probably terrible, really, for the for the health of the sport. So I'm all over the place with it. But I do find it if I'm watching like Spurs Liverpool at the weekend, you go, Oh, this is great when he goes to the monitor. You know what I really find funny? When you see like the referee go to the monitor, which is just like a plasma screen telly, what mm. looks like on the end of a broom, it's a really <laughs> remedial kit. When you see the fans behind like abusing the ref, you're like, <laughs> that's not gonna help him, right? Just chill out. If anything, say, yes, please look. Oh, hi, referee. You know, you know they're like, giving him stick when he's just trying to watch it. It's just incredible. I, I just love the pantomime element of football. So uh, against my better judgment, I think VAR has um, has improved that element in a way. It's, it's made football a little bit more outrageous. Um, I just want to go back to what you're saying about the manager there. There was a point where it looked like he was probably going to go after the Leicester game. Would you have been gutted there because of what he's come to represent in a way of, you know, the connection with the fans that you know, you're such a big fan. It would have been a big shame if he'd gone for you. I would have been gutted if he'd have gone. And I just think if you know why the problems exist, then I think it's, you know, none of the problems really were his fault. Now, at some point, obviously he is the manager of the football club. So at some point he has to take responsibility for, for the results. And But that's true of any manager at any football club. But given that you could see that, We'd had a lot of players brought in um, and he was trying to figure out that side. And we're newly promoted after a quarter of a century. Then you're like, well, it, it would have felt very unfair at that stage, I think. And the decision to keep him, I think, so far has been vindicated, really, because certainly the victory against Liverpool. And then, you know, we were just on a losing streak that thankfully has ended. Um, and we're picking up points now and, and, and beating Liverpool is just fantastic. So I would have been upset. And I think we do have a different relationship with Steve Cooper than we have had with really any manager for a very long time. So I think most of us think he is the right man to, to keep us in the Premier League. And it's not even just about that. He's the sort of manager that you want to be at Forest for a long time. You're like, I want to go to cup finals with this guy. And I, I truly believe he's the sort of guy that can make us do it. So um, I thought it was immense wisdom on behalf of the club to keep him um, and to keep him for a couple of years. And I think that, you know, I think there are moments in football that are, that are very... And actually, as a club, I, probably not since the maybe Clough or Clarkey days have we felt this, but where it feels like the whole club is united for a moment. And whether that's 
at promotion, which obviously, but I think that decision to keep Steve Cooper was the fans, the management, the players, and the owners all united at that point. And I thought that, in a way, there was something very special about that. You thought, we're all agreed here that he's the right guy. And it felt like, it just felt like we were all just, you know, there was, there was an element of harmony about it that I liked. And, and um, obviously, as a fan, you just want to see that. You just, for Forrest, we need it to work. Obviously, the, the priority as a fan is, I don't want Forrest to get relegated. And also, not just that, but we, I want us to thrive in the coming years. Um, but I want that, to, I think all of us want that to be with Steve Cooper, which I just think is such an amazing tribute to what he's done for us all. I mean, I don't even think he's been here a year yet. Or maybe he's been here a year, just over a year. I think it was his anniversary the other week. Remarkable that he's become such a totemic part of our lives and, and, and part of the forest identity. So um, I'm just so pleased. And, and I, I just want it to work for him because obviously he, he's very talented and he seems like such a thoroughly decent man and really seems to genuinely love the club and the city and the people. So, God, I, I think we want it to work for him more than anyone for a very long time. I mean, since Psycho, really. Last year at Wembley, it kind of culminated that whole connection between the, the players and the fans and the squad. And it felt like, you know, Everybody, they say don't fall in love with lone players, but everyone fell in love with <laughs> and yeah. Garner and Davis and everyone. That team, I think we could probably reel off most of that starting eleven for in 10, 20 years' time. Yeah. Have you got any kind of connection with this current lot yet, or has there been too much turnover for that? I think Dean Henderson's incredible. And I think he really, that gladiatorial way that he commands the city ground. I mean, just the way he goes for every ball, every save means something to him, the intensity with which he plays, the penalty saves. I just think he's exceptional. So I, I, I think he's brilliant. Morgan Gibbs-White, Nico Williams. Gibbs-White is such a good footballer. And I don't think we've seen even half of what he can do yet. I mean, his goal at the weekend, his footwork on the edge of the box. Oh, my God. This Not only is he fast and, and accurate, you know, his technical ability is incredible. And he can just, he, he's so creative. Nico Williams, I think, is great. Um, I mean, obviously, the established players that we love, Yates, and Warren, and, and, and so many others. Lingard is someone that you want to see a bit more from. You think, you know, you really want to see someone like that really shine and, and take a game by the scruff of the leg. I think as well, Collymore used to do that. You know, when you've got like a big star in your team and they can just dictate games. Mm. I think in a way we're, we're still adjusting to the fact of our, of our league position. Because when we signed in, you're like, oh my God, you know, just give the ball to him and it's, it'll go off every game and stuff. And obviously that's just not the way it is. That's maybe that because the way we're playing. But um, Dean Henderson and Morgan Gibbs-White, I think, are absolutely incredible footballers. And so I feel very strong. I'll be very sad if either of them. I mean, Henderson's on loan as well. This is the problem. Exactly, yeah. You've fallen over the first hurdle. God! <laughs> oh, I hope we keep him beyond the summer. He's, he's magic. Um, have you got to that stage yet where you're looking at the league table and you see, obviously, your mates with John Richards, and so this means to my, but you know, Leeds have won. You're a bit gutted and thinking, oh, that's another team that's picked up points. Or is it too early for that? Oh, no. I think, yeah. You're looking at Wolves and Leeds and Southampton. Yeah. I mean, with Leeds, it's tricky because of him because I, I obviously don't... They're Leeds. So if you're... <laughs> there's only so much time or love or respect I can have for them. But I, for, for he and I, we've been on a similar journey at a similar time, Forest and Leeds, from a similar position. So we waited so long, both of us, to get back into the Premier League. It's great that we're both in there. And we haven't played them at all yet this season because that game got postponed. So we've still got to play them home and away. We've waited years to do that as mates. So it'd be a shame if this is the one season we get to do it in the Premier League. So ideally, if we stay up, I kind of do want them to stay up as well. Equally, I don't care. As long as we stay up, obviously, I don't care who <laughs> whose expense it is. Um. But, yeah, I think now you can't help but look around. And that's the problem, particularly with the Bournemouth game stuff. You think, ah. But you can't, you know, you can't. It's like, what do they say when you're driving? Like, you know, if you've just done something wrong, don't think about it because you then create mm. another mistake. You have to kind of focus on the road ahead. But that Bournemouth game was like, that was just a bit like kissing the curb and thinking, oh, God, that was like a moment of loss of concentration. Now I'm, I'm in danger of going through a red light here because I can't stop stewing over hitting that speed bump. Um. Yeah, what, what, equally, 
the, the other, th- and I think everyone's in a slight state of flux about this. It is so tight down there. Mm. And the fact that we're picking up points now, and I know Leeds beat Liverpool after we did, but we still beat Liverpool and we were better than them and we did deserve to win it. So you think, how bad are we then? Because if we can beat, you know, we had a terrible start. We had a terrible start last season. And, you know, and I realise it's different in the championship, but this is a manager that is used to getting this club out of the bottom three. I've used, to, you know, obviously I haven't been here long enough to do it once, but I just think we're not actually terrible. So, what do you reckon, mid table? Seventeenth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I said fifteenth at the start of the season. The thing is, like you've already mentioned, teams there like Southampton, Wolves, Leeds. I said this yesterday. I've got growing up in uh, Telford. I've got a lot of friends who are Wolves fans, and they're not worried about relegation at all, which seems a bit weird to me because they're like an established. Premier League team, they've got the ex-Spain coach in. They think they're going to be great, but I wouldn't bank on that. You know, I think I think Villa will be all right, but Southampton, Wolves, Bournemouth, Fulham still. There's enough teams for Forest to pick off, aren't there? Brentford. Yeah, and after after the World Cup, you know, who knows what that does to so many players in the Premier League and what that does to teams' form and all the rest of it. Mm. It just it's like a it's like firing a, a cue ball into a like a into a pack of Reds, you know, they're just going to like that. That World Cup is going to be so disruptive to so many club seasons in ways that we just don't know yet. So, in a way, you think, well, after that, and surely by then, surely by then, those 23 players we signed in the summer will have had enough time on the training ground <laughs> over the winter to figure something out. I think by then we'd have gelled. I think we've figured most of it out. I, I think, think have, yeah. a, a centre half, I'd like to see Worrell in the team, really. Um, and they need a striker to step up or they need to buy one. They need a bit of consistency. But otherwise, I think the rest of the team's not not horrendous. It looks pretty close to being a solid Premier League team, I think. Yeah, and Taiwo always looks pretty dangerous. I mean, there are games like the Arsenal game where, you know, sometimes it is. When you're there, depending on where you're sat or stood, it's very hard to see formations and things. I mean, Gibbs mm. White looked like he was playing quite deep for a lot of that game. You think, well, he's one of our chances to actually do something. I know he's got pace, but... It just seemed to be like try and bobble the ball to Taiwo and see what happens. And you think, well, it, it, we do need a bit more than that. I think we've, got, we've got a few strikers. So, I mean, obviously, if we get another one, fine. But maybe it's the start. Maybe it's the system. I don't know. This I set, I, I stumble into this sentence really not understanding what I'm on about. But maybe it's the system in which we're playing that doesn't allow, or, you know, because we're trying to not lose games. Players like Gibbs White and Taiwo and others can't express themselves. I don't know. I, I, I mean, this is the problem. I, I don't know. I just think of, it feels like we've got a few strikers. I mean, maybe they're not. I don't know. Are they good? At, it, it's, <laughs> we're obviously not scoring enough goals. But I mean, equally, it's not like scoring goals is a major problem for us. We are scoring mm. goals. Mm. It's just we don't. I think that obviously the temptation is to go, we need a Colin Moore or Van Hooyd on court, you know a DJ or a Marlon and like that they are or a Lewis Graben like they're always going to be the examples but I think maybe it's hard to score goals in the Premier League and we've obviously shifted around with the system a little bit three at the back or four at the back or whatever and obviously that then affects what else you can do further up the pitch so I don't know I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer is <laughs> just score more goals don't concede any that would be my advice how do you form your opinion of players then because I suppose I watch a lot of football and get involved and look, look at the tactics and all that. If you're a guy who doesn't look at the tactics so much, are you a bit like Donald Trump who just takes the, the opinion of the last person he hears or do you uh, form your own opinion on players just based on what you still yeah. see without having that yeah. massive self-confessed depth of knowledge? What, what shapes it? Yeah, just based on what I see. I just think, well, he's playing really well. You know, I remember a couple of I think we might have talked about this last time when Yates was getting a load of stick. I was like, he's great. I could see that he was playing well. I was like, now maybe that means I don't know what I'm on about. Now everyone's on side with the eights, thank God. But it, it was just, I always thought it was odd that he was getting singled out. I think, well, maybe those people are the ones who don't know what they're on about. And I always think I don't know, but I'm like, well, Gibbs White looks good. Henderson looks great. Uh, I agree with you. I'd like to see Worrell play more. Uh, so then I'm like, well, maybe I do get it. I just don't, I, I just don't like, I can never tell. 
brought, you know, when they're switching from three to five in and out of possession away from it, all that sort of thing. I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, but I just based it on watching it. I'm like, well, I thought it was good. I thought, he, you know. Yeah. You're not bothered if Create about chances bothered or about scored XG goals or maps and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't really go in for that side of it. I just based it on what I see. I'm based on what I say, I think Gibbs White's excellent. I think uh, Yates has always been excellent. Henderson's great. Uh, I think Nico Williams is just such a talent. And and it's so close to sort of all coming together in a way because his he can pick out passes and see moves. It reminds me a bit of Andy Reid where they just read the game so well and they can just carve defences open just with such a well-placed timed pass in a way that I, I think that first game, I think that West Ham game, I'm watching that thinking, crikey. The sort of long passes he can pick out, the accuracy and just his footballing brain is exceptional. And um, obviously I loved Spence last season, but I don't think he had that. He had a lot of things. But it was just like, oh my God, this guy has like got a phenomenal football brain on him. So um, he looks really good. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the problem is once you start going around all of them, you're like, oh, I love him as well. I love McKenna and I love Cook. And I, was like, I love them all. Um, but just, you know, I, anyone who wears the shirt, obviously, you just they're gods, aren't they? How do you feel about the championship now? I've come, to, I think I might have put this in the notes. I've come to loathe it. Like, I yeah. just dread going back to it. I think what I've realized is, like, you watch a lot of Premier League football on Sky and Super Sunday, you think, yeah, the standard's really good. And then you watch Forest in the Premier League and you think, bloody hell, the standard is really, really good. And I didn't appreciate how high it is. And if, if they go back to the championship, I think I'm probably going to hate it if they didn't come straight back up. The championship is crap. I always hated it. And I, ne- I never understood people who said, Oh, yeah, it's great. It's, it's horrible. It's a horrible place to be. And I already know it's such an insight. Not being there, you're like, I couldn't give a toss about it. I only knew about it because we were there. Do you know what I mean? Like, no one talks about You realise when you take the step up to the Premier League, just the level of coverage, you're on the news mm. more, you're more prominent on the BBC website. Other people are talking about you. Like, in terms of mainstream global media, even if you're bottom of the Premier League, just the detailed coverage you can get about your club and your side is just incredible. When you're in the championship, you basically, no one can hear you scream. You're just in the middle of the void. You're nothing, really. I know, now, obviously, fundamentally, I know that's not true, but you're basically irrelevant to what the world is talking about as regards to English football. And, and we waited so long to get out of there. The thought of going back, you know, that it, would, it wouldn't be like resitting your GCSEs. It would be like been a year into your A-levels and them going, actually, your AS-level results are so bad, you're going to have to go back and sit your GCSEs again like a year later. You're like, but I've got the results. Like, yeah, but you've, we think you've gone backwards. You're like, what? But I left that school. It's like, uh, it would just be the most, it would be like going back to prison. You're just like, oh, no, what? It just, it would feel so unfair. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it will be fair because, by definition, we'll be in the bottom three. But you just like, I can't. The thought of immediately being back. Ugh. It's like um, like an anxiety dream, isn't it? You know, when people dream about being at work naked or at the bus stop with any kind of stuff like that. You know, it'd be like Forrest being back in the championship. It'd be like, just a bad dream. Yeah. Even if we do go down, I still think we're in a way better position to come back up than we probably were at the start of the season we got promoted. So there's that. But yeah. Just ugh, not now. We've only just got here. Do you know what I mean? It's not when yeah. you travel, you think, don't let my flights or my trains be mucked up. Not today, mate. And it's, It would feel like that. I've like, waited all this time to get here. Please tell me you've got her booking. And the Premier League's going, no, your name's, your name's not down, I'm afraid. You're, you're staying at the Championship. <laughs> it's a three-hour three walk in the dark. Yeah, oh, for... anyway, yeah. I just cut. Yeah, I it just I ha- I always hated it. I, the thought of being back, uh, just in a way, I'm not engaging with it at the moment. I'm like, well, we are a Premier League team at the that is a fact. Yeah, it's a bit like like in your game playing like the London Palladium or something, yeah. getting your big breakthrough, and they're like, oh, actually, you've got to go back to. The Glee Club or whatever. Actually, the not in Glee Club's really good, but um... Glee Club's amazing. But yes, it would be like it would be like in any st- part of your life making a breakthrough and then someone going, "Yeah, 
you know, a lot of people feel like that in their work, I think. So many people say you always feel like someone's going to tap you on the shoulder and go, sorry, mate, you shouldn't have this job. You know what I mean? Like, But it's particularly when you like your job. And with Forrest, it's like that. The fear that football's going to say, yeah, sorry. Do you, do you think you're in the championship? Oh, you're in the wrong seat. Oh, no. Oh. You're right, though. I was listening to Five Live the other day, and it's like, oh, two o'clock, here's the team news. Here's 40 minutes on the Premier League. 2.45, we'll go to the EFL for three minutes. And last season, I was thinking, it didn't it just goes over your head, but this season, you notice it. And like with this podcast as well, we've done loads of stuff with you know, Premier League productions, Five Live, Talk Sport, that no one gave a monkey's about it really last season. But it is a different world. And I would be despairing if it ends after one year. I'm going to... Um, Ask you for a prediction, so it oh, might throw this back at you. Which three teams are going down? Then it could include Forest if you want. I don't think it will. No, not Forest. I'd say Southampton, mm. Wolves. <clears throat> God, Bournemouth. Do you know what? Part with Bournemouth. Yeah, to get the league up. Let's have a look. Bournemouth are just above it at the moment. Yeah, Everton. Have they? Yeah, Bournemouth are on a terrible run, aren't they? Southampton, Bournemouth. Ah, part of me just can't believe it would be Wolves. Uh, well, they haven't got a striker, have they? They might buy one. It's like you said earlier, the World Cup is like the cue ball in, in yeah. making a break, isn't it? So they might they might sign someone. I can't, uh, I can't believe Brentford they weren't done. very good at the weekend without Tony, but still got a draw. Yeah. Ah... Uh... I think Villa will be all right. I think Leeds will be all right. I do think Brentford will be all right. I'm going to go Southampton bottom. Yeah. Then Bournemouth. I can't believe Wolves or Everton would go down, but I'm going to say Wolves. Southampton, Bournemouth, Wolves. You heard it here first. I will say then Southampton, Bournemouth. Uh, and I'll say Leeds. I know your mate wouldn't like to hear that. Well, not that you give a monkey's what I think, but <laughs> they're a bit up and down. Jesse Marsh is funny as well. I kind of can't decide if I like him or think he's just an idiot. Like when they scored at Liverpool, he's doing like that <laughs> Booyakasha <laughs> Ali G <laughs> celebration. Yeah. Maybe I'm just like that. prejudiced against Americans. I don't know. I think there is an element of that, isn't there? There's definitely an element of when you think of a football fan that doesn't know football, you think like the, the cliche is soccer and all that type of stuff. But uh, he is quite likable. But it's Leeds, isn't it? That's the thing. But you think they'll go down? <laughs> I think they might. I mean, I know they've won the last two. I think they're a bit up and down. I yeah. Yeah, Bamford's obviously a popular player here. They need him to be, to be fit and... I don't know. Let's see if Marsh lasts the season. It's interesting. I do think Forest can be all right. I'm not saying they definitely will, but I think they're going to have enough about them, hopefully, by the end of January. I hope they don't go mental in January. We were saying this yesterday. Don't sign 10 players, please. Just <laughs> just sign two or three really good ones. Yeah. Maybe ship out three or four of these signings that haven't worked. A Bolly or a Barde or even a Dennis, someone like that. But Do you know what? Yeah. It's funny because it is around Christmas, isn't it? And it is like... If you were to, if someone was to say to you for Christmas, would you rather have a hundred Christmas presents, but they're all from like Poundland and they're all just stuff you didn't want, like a hundred mm. key rings, or do you want one big good present? I'd rather have one big good present, even mm. for half the price. I'd rather spend fifty quid on my main present and just get me that than buy me a hundred presents that were all a quid each that were just like. A pencil sharpener, a paperweight, stuff I didn't need. So if Mr. You know, the Santa Claus of Forest, Mr. Maranakis is <laughs> listening to yeah. One Boy's Wish. Just yeah, get us a really good what's I don't know what the latest gift is these days. Is it a PS5? Whatever the whatever the equivalent of that is. Probably. Like, yeah. Although they're <laughs> fortune, aren't they? PS5. I'm I'm not into gaming, but I don't know how people afford it. No, it's probably a different podcast, isn't it? But my god, 500 quid, some of them probably more. I know, I've got a six year old 
who well i've got two kids who love minecraft but the six-year-old i can tell is going to be by the time he's 10 he's going to be asking for one of those gaming chairs headsets curved monitors <laughs> especially built rooms to take his bed out <laughs> and all that stuff. <laughs> well, it all looks cool doesn't it I'm, uh, the thing is i'm sure it's amazing fun but the price of it i mean when we were kids like a master system or a mega driver is expensive they're probably like 80 quid yeah yeah, I had a Mega Drive. I didn't have a... Oh, I had an N64 later. We're the same age, aren't we? I remember Golden Axe, Revenge of Shinobi, Goldeneye on the 64. Goldeneye on the N64. My mate had an N64. With the, that had like the sort of rumble yeah. pack. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed... I had a Master System and just played like Enduro Racer and Sonic. It's like <laughs> crap games, but they were good fun. But not now. Now it's like, you go into these lads' bedrooms, it's like NASA. Yeah. They've just got like it's like minority report. The whole things are just like God knows what it's gonna be like in five years. Um, but yes, I guess what would be the forest equivalent that we want we want a PS5 and a gaming chair and a curved yeah. screen monitor rather than 20 goals, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh last forest topic before we move on briefly. Um I mentioned FPL, obviously I'm avidly into it. You do a podcast on it. Now I listen to it. You you talk about how you have forest players in your team. I'm yeah. the opposite. I'm a real bastard. I'll sign players to target forest if I think they're going to get tanked. Does that make me pretty evil signing Trossard and Gabriel Jesus and players like that? I I don't think it makes you evil, but it, <laughs> obviously you're not a superstitious person. So I think that's good because mm. I I can't. I mean, I say that all my forest players are permanently on the bench. William Johnson and McKenna. <laughs> So I have them, but like I don't really use them a great deal at the moment because I'm still very competitive. But yeah, I don't think I could. I don't think I could be that. Um, obviously, I know that it would be magical thinking. It, I mean, if, your logic is sounder because you know it makes no difference really, and and you're playing a game where you want to do well and you're doing everything in your power to do it. Whereas I'm on a on an app, deliberately not picking players that will play against Forest in case what. Steve Cooper's going to go in at half time and go. Sorry, lads, we've we've had oh, the FPL apps telling us that uh, Fordy's chosen a load of players who are playing against us today, so uh, we might go back <laughs> and go home. You're like, of course, it's not going to make any difference. So I don't know what. I just I think it is deep down in my heart. I would feel like on some level I was betraying Forrest, and that's because I'm an idiot. So I'm the fool, and you're the how many? Where are how, what points are you on then? Because let's see if it actually works. That's, because if you're doing better than me, then it's justified, isn't it? Uh, okay, well, I was doing well three weeks ago. I was 250,000 in the world, which is pretty okay. I'm down to oh 600,000 now. I've got 859 points. Okay, I'm on 798 points. So oh, that's still quite a small gap at this stage. One of my is, but... lad who covers Stoke for us is um, in the top 5,000 in the world. It's impressive. A bit annoying, but impressive. Has he got a girlfriend? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the worst go. part is, like, he doesn't oh seem that arsed about it. Either. He kisses him and everything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, like, wow. oh, what are you doing this week? He's like, oh, I might do this. I might do that. I'll just decide an hour before the deadline, and I might even forget. It's like you're five thousand in the world. It's ridiculous. He's playing you on a little bit, isn't he? He's like, he'll be on all sorts of apps and stats and YouTube videos and all sorts. Probably. Probably. There you go. So I'm seven hundred ninety-eight and had a bad start, and I've done that. With three Forest players in the squad. Pretty impressive. You no, know, it's not bad, is it? No. You're doing better than you were last season. Anyway, I know, I was terrible. I, I really didn't understand how the game works, which was a foolish move to then do a podcast based on a game. <laughs> I've got I my brother understand. into it. My brother messaged me periodically. He goes, what's this bench boost thing? What's this free hit thing? <laughs> it is great fun, because I'd always been very cynical about it and thought, you know, it's, you know, for nerds and virgins and stuff like that. And now I'm into it. I'm just like, I'm so addicted. I'm so addicted and so um, I get so much enjoyment and play. In a way, I've never gambled and I I never I, I get that it has a hold on some people. I never got a buzz out of gambling at all. Even when I'd occasionally put a quid on, like, it never did it for me. This absolutely does it for me, and it's free. You like you get all yeah. the hits of like, oh, I've done well or I've won, and you don't have to you know you don't have to finance your house or like lose your car. It's great. It's basically free gambling. That sounds terrible. That's probably not the right way to think of it. It's it's just really good fun that won't ruin your life. Um, 
last five minutes or so. You're a big England fan as well. Probably, I watch the finals, but I can't watch a Nations League game or a friendly or anything like that. Are you avidly watching the World Cup? Are you going to the World Cup? I'm not. I'm part of the England supporters travellers group, and and the tickets came up on there, and I, I just don't think I can justify going with that. We're used to football's morals obviously being fairly elastic, and mm. um, that that actually drives me mad. And I know it's difficult, you know, in a globalised world and all the rest of it, but the ownership of certain Premier League clubs should not be allowed. And I was appalled that Russia had it. I didn't feel safe going there. I didn't want to go there as an England fan. Um, a friend of mine got his jaw broken over there and I was just like, you know, horrific. Um, and he wasn't even out there for the games, you know, it's just like, a, it's not even, it's just awful. And then with this, you're like, I just, the problem is I can't, I don't think you can simultaneously say it's a disgrace. And it's not that I'm, I, not, I think I'm going to have any influence on this or anything, but collectively we can. I, I don't blame the players for going. I'll watch all the games. I'm desperate for us to win it. It won't mean anything less if we win this than had we won it elsewhere. But I, I can't justify going. I can't sit here with all my mates and say, isn't it a disgrace? I think it's vile that that regime has been allowed to have this World Cup. I mean, for a number of reasons, I think it's appalling. And we've not hosted one for God knows how. It just the whole thing's disgraceful, and it's as totally as a result of corruption. And then go, oh, but oh, I'm going to go. Hmm. I mean, well, you, then you, you, whatever values you have, can't be completely compromised sometimes by your desire to go and watch a football match. I'll, I'll watch it on telly, um, but I, I did on an hour a bit. I was like, because I, I, I love watching England, and I think we'll do really well. And I would love to go abroad and watch us play in a tournament. It's just like, what, what's not to like? I went to Euro 2016 and saw us play, and that all kicked off. But, um, I, I was like, and especially after the other summer, like, you know, I really want to try and go and watch England in every tournament now, if possible, or be there and soak it up. And what a privilege to be in that position. But you just, I just can't justify it. I, I think, And I just wish, I think the players have to go. You shouldn't punish the players for this because it's their careers. Um I just wish it would be such an amazing statement if no one went. Mm. Collectively, if, the, if global football fans just said, we're not going to this, it's a disgrace they ever had it for a number of reasons, and we're just not going to go. And then that's the only thing that will force organisations like FIFA to not do it. But they just know. They know we're too loyal. And you saw it with Newcastle. So many fans who, had that been any other club getting take, being taken over, by the saddest, oh, it's a disgrace. When it says, oh, well, you know, Mike Ashley was a nightmare. This is incredible that we're going through this. Just how easily we're allowing the thing that we love to be, and it is genuine, it is diplomatic cover for human rights abuses. And I know this isn't the sort of stuff we usually talk about in football. And people, ah, oh, you know, it's talk about the game. And it, football's like an escape from all that. But when football is used as it is being done to, to launder Putin's reputation, and that World Cup in Russia was four years after he invaded Ukraine. Mm. When he annexed Crimea. And no one gave a shit. It just drives me mad. And then this lot get it. And even the, the whole selection process where they announced 18 and 22 together to encourage vote swapping. They, it was a double announcement. Russia and Qatar. I just think no, there is no more proof needed about how rotten elements of football are. And then as fans, we're then put in a position where do you go and legitimise this thing or not? And I think the only thing we can do is effectively, as fans, go on strike from it. So we still watch it at home. We still go to the pub. Still go out in Nottingham and watch it and cheer every guy. I still am desperate for us to win it. I'm still really excited about the World Cup. I just don't think it should be there. Um, and it's just, you know, it's not about me. But obviously, for a generation of fans where England is starting to do well, particularly someone who's just always supported England anyway, I'd have gone to this. If it was anywhere else, I'd have tried to go to a game. So, I, I, you know, if you're on the supporters travel club, you get like the, constantly getting emails like oh i needed to like unsubscribe from it so i don't want to be tempted to go um but i'm not going i i, I think it is appalling and mm. um you know for, this stuff does matter actually like for, for a long time obviously you try and keep politics and football separate and that's something i'm very mindful of but when when we are being used our loyalty and and, and the game that we've all helped create and sustain and generations before us have created and sustained like our thing our effectively our tacit support of it has been abused to cover awful things deaths of migrant workers whose families will never find out 
ha- whether those people are alive or dead. At a very basic level, that's appalling, let alone all the other stuff. So, um, yeah, it's a shame because it, it, it is it has overshadowed it a bit. It, mm. it, it's definitely been. And the fact that it's in the winter, you're like, well, when it was when they agreed when they were given it, it wasn't meant to be in the winter. And they just didn't give the sh- didn't give a shit. FIFA, they're like, oh, fine, yeah, have it. And then <laughs> at the time, I was like, you can't have it in the summer. Oh, we'll make it work. We'll air condition the streets. And now that like, oh, we're going to have to have it in the winter. So, like, our domestic football, you know, everyone's domestic football schedule is now at the mercy of this thing. I guess there's a novelty element to it in a weird way. You're like, in the middle of winter, it's quite a nice thing to have a World Cup. I don't know, maybe. But uh, it makes me sick. And it just, I think football's changing now. And I think football fans are changing. Certainly, players are using their platform more. And you've seen it with obviously the England team and with, you know, the Premier League taking the knee and everything, but players like Rashford and Kane being far more mindful of their social impact. And that's not about them being woke or Ramona's or anything like that. It's, this is a game that disproportionately rewards very talented people. And when that their talent is used, which it basically is, the fact that our boys are going to go and play in Qatar legitimizes it on some level it does and i remember during i remember during the 2018 world cup a pundit i can't remember who it was said oh i know there's been i think it was on the bbc it was on like a major broadcaster oh i know there's been a lot of um i know there's been a lot of uh controversy about this tournament but uh, you know we have been treated very well <laughs> of course you have because you're on the bbc and like they, they, just to put just how, how easily people are bought i find very um disappointing i guess but uh that's just you can't shake it off really with this one at the no. back of your mind you're always just thinking this is ah. but that said the moment the game kicks off i'm straight back into it like i would be if it was in anywhere any other country because i think england are amazing and i love gareth southgate i think we've got some phenomenal players and i still feel like we haven't seen the best of foden yet in an england shirt um and, and all the young talent that's coming through. I t- I t- oh, God, I'd love us to win it. I mean, that's the problem. <laughs> if we get to the final and someone goes, I've got to get to the final. You, know. well, you can't go now. <laughs> I know. Part of me goes, you know, actually, I think this tournament has done a lot of good for human rights. And uh... <laughs> you're trying to like desperately row back. We've got a spare ticket. I could get you a flight. Oh, um, shit. <laughs> I know. I do like, I mean, like, I like Gary Neville, but then. I listened to him on Guardian Football Weekly kind of tacitly justifying going out there to be a pundit. And then he did an overlap. I really like the overlap as well. He did one with David Beckham where they're touring like players' hotels in Qatar. And I didn't watch. I I gave up after about 15 minutes. He might have asked him about human rights. I don't know. But it's disappointing to see. I do feel for fans. Like you mentioned Newcastle there. It's the it's the exploitation of fans and their loyalty, isn't it? Like yes. if if Saudis or whoever a questionable regime bought Forest tomorrow, and then you like I don't go to all the games because of work and stuff. But the mates who come on here go to every game. It's a big part of their life, a big part of their family, their mental health. And for yes, I mean sport watching is playing up to that really as much as anything to to justify, it, isn't it? It's not not on, is it? No, and I I get, I, for pundits, it's different. I think it is because it's their job. So I think it is different if, in a way, it's like players. Like I, d- I wouldn't, Harry Kane shouldn't have to miss out on the chance of winning the World Cup because decisions that he has zero influence over went against him. So I, I, you, I would never want to punish athletes or players. Uh, and I guess in a way, pundits, you know, I can't say I want to watch it on telly. Um, we need pundits and camera people and all the rest of it to be there. So... You know, if we were all going to say, well, we're not going, <laughs> we'll watch it on Sunday, but that doesn't involve Gary Neville and, or someone else going out there. And I get, I, the, 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 the bit of Gary Neville's argument that I have a lot of, firstly, he, I mean, he's just like football to his core and just believes in it as a power of good. Almost to the extent where it's almost like a religion. And, and I totally get that. And, and I identify with a lot of that. And I also do believe in the power of soft power and, and influence. And if you shine a light on these places... Uh, and and you go there, you, you perhaps have some influence to change them for the better. And and I think, I, I, again, I'm not totally against that argument, but I didn't, as a fan, want to be there to effectively legitimise the regime because I think that basically the the, the the cons outweigh the pros. Um, 
But I, Gary, Gary Neville is someone who's really evangelical about football, and I think he truly believes that having the tournament there will do some good. So on that level, I understand his decision, of course. And, and, and you know, any opinion's fine, really. Um, it's just for me as a fan, I think I'm so strongly against them having it. I just can't. I went on a holiday, actually. Uh, at the start of uh, September. <laughs> Going mad. And we had a layover in, not a layover, like a connecting flight from Qatar. So it was in Doha mm. Airport. Uh, Doha Airport. Doha Airport. And um, I was like, oh my God, there'll be loads of World Cup stuff there. And it kind of, I, I felt kind of bad because they've got these like murals and artworks about the World Cup. I was like, oh my God, it's so exciting. You think, obviously for a lot of the people who live there, it's great. But again, that's not the point. You know, there are certain regimes that buy these tournaments in order to make themselves appear more reasonable, more honourable than they are. And the danger is of Qatar hosting the World Cup is that it just creates that general view that, oh, they're not that bad. That regime's quite nice. And 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 the allies that allows them to effectively buy in the media will on some level be complicit in delivering that message. And I then worry as well, how much does the Qatari regime actually want to change? <laughs> you know, this is about, as it is often with ownership of football clubs, it's a it's a status symbol. It, we're basically just another diamond in an already encrusted ring of wealth. And um, that may, th that doesn't sit right. And also you just think, if you're going to spread it around the world, spread it to South America or other African countries or Eastern Europe. You know, there are other more noble places this could have gone in, in the pursuit of soft power or diplomacy, if that's what you're really trying to do. Because then the other part, because well, it was FIFA that made the decision. It wasn't the UN. Mm. You know, it was... People who I fundamentally do not trust. So then I just think, oh, God. it's a shame because oh, I'd really want to go. I, was, I really ummed and ahed over it. And then as it got close, I was just like, I can't. I just can't justify it, which is a shame because I think we might do really well at it. But equally, what better place to watch it than in South Bank and then all in. Imagine we win it. And we're all in the fountains in Market Square afterwards, behaving in a sensible and responsible manner. You know, that, that'd be better than being in Qatar. Yeah. I'm not as optimistic as you about the tournament. I'm just not sure if we've regressed a bit from the Euros, like well, Maguire and Shaw and Reese James is injured and uh, Trippi is really good, but and Sterling's out of form. It, it feels like it's the wrong location, like... Uh, Climate wise, at the wrong time for me, so maybe another quarter final defeat. I hope not, but it doesn't feel quite as optimistic about this tournament. Okay, what I would say is Maguire is a brilliant footballer, and whatever's gone on at Man United is way bigger than him. And he's just ended up getting bullied and taking the rap for it. For England, I mean, think of the Euros, he was incredible. The World Cup, he was incredible. This brilliant goal scoring defender who was exceptional in every game he played for us. He, he's a phenomenal footballer. And, uh, I mean, Kyle Walker is exceptional, so I hope he's fit. Foden's a genius. Kane's one of the best strikers on the planet. The only reason people aren't talking about Kane this year is because Haaland's just insane. Um, we've got some um, incredible... And the Nations League thing, you're like... I think they were just knackered. They just played so many games. And also... You've got to experiment a little bit and you think, I'd rather be a bit crap in the Nations League and prioritise the World Cup. Like, mix things up a bit, even if just, just for him to confirm the system he's going to stick with all the players or whatever. Just use the Nations League as a, as a testing ground. And I love the Nations League. I've, I prefer having the Nations League to having um, friendlies all the time. I think it's good that those inter-tournament games are, are, have a competitive element and, and have like an implication for qualifying for Euros and things. I think that's, and seeding, which makes it so much, there's more riding on it and that's good. I just think he is an exceptional manager. An ex, a Pickford is an incredible goalkeeper and he didn't play in those Nations League games. So you just think, well, actually, when you when you play the strongest England 11, Calvin Phillips, Declan Rice is better now than he was in the Euros. Kane is going into this tournament on form. I mean, before that first game against Croatia in the Euros, I remember the, the, I was at Wembley and I remember them announcing the team. It was like Sterling, Phillips. I was like, 
Sten was one of the best players we had that tournament. Phillips was incredible against Croatia. You know, players come into... And, and the England camp is a different thing now. And it exists effectively as a different... It's effectively a club rather than just this thing that they go to periodically. It's got its own ecosystem. It's got its own psychology. And I think Harry Maguire will play better for England than he's played for Manchester United this season. I think he feels more of like... Almost in a way, he's an England player who periodically plays for Man United rather than the other way around. I think it really suits them. I think Sterling feels completely at home there. I think these players can really express themselves in England. I think, just think we are definitely one of the best teams at that tournament. And then there's just that extra added hope. And I just think Southgate now knows how to get to the latter stages of tournaments. I think I think they've cracked whatever that is in general. I, I just think I just think we're really good. I think we're really good. And our time is, if, if it's not this, it's coming. Like you can feel that steady incremental improvement. And then the, the other players that are around the squad, Tammy Abraham or Ivan Tony and players like that, just this endless, makes some mounts incredible. You start to think about the depth of talent we've got. Particularly in attacking positions, it's it's exceptional. We've got yeah. one of the best goalkeepers in the world. So then you go, well, okay, what if Carl Walker, you know, you worry about Trent Alexander-Arnold tracking back or whatever, but you're like, in, in the grand scheme of things, when you think of some of the squads we've taken to tournaments and the physical state that they've been in, this lot are incredible. And I think the manager is marvellous. So I, I, I'm i really excited about England. I think, I think we're as a country, the men's team. And it's no coincidence that the women's thing's happening at the same time. There is something structurally happening uh, with England football and the way it's managed and our national teams. The whole thing with St. George's Park and and the and the under-18s and the under at every level. Like the setup is fundamentally different to, to what it was when I was growing up. It's just superior now. The emphasis is on winning tournaments and, and the women showed the way to do it. And I think, God... Foden, I, ju- I just I, he excites me more than any England player since Stuart Pearce, I think, since Gaza. Oh, He's I was incredible. gonna say Gaza, Foden, Foden could be this generation's Gaza, the way he oh. glides across the ground. And you haven't mentioned Madison there either, I think he should be a part of it, exactly. I mean, like, think of the players, think of if you were to say, right, what would England's subs bench be? It would be one of the best teams in the tournament, the players we can bring on. I mean, then obviously there's like, you know, Brazil, whatever, you know, <laughs> bigger teams that win all the time. <laughs> you know, when this meets reality, it's something else. But I, 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 I think it's, and it's, when it starts like a fortnight or something, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's like five days or something between the last two weeks on game. Monday, I think, is our yeah, yeah. first game. Yeah. It's mad. Oh, God. Do you know what? I've still got, I don't know where to put this. We can see the Gaza thing on the wall. I mean, yeah. that sort of sums up really fast. And then I've got this. My girlfriend oh, got me this after the Euros. Yeah. Christmas. It's done by um, Art of Football, who, who people in Nottingham will know well. Yeah. But I think she thought it was like the A4 size. I mean, I don't know if you can... T- it's, it's massive. <laughs> I, can't, I can't fit it anywhere. But even if you just take that, look at them. Declan Rice is better than he was at the Euros. Pickford's better. Luke Shaw's... John Stones! We haven't even mentioned John Stones. Bakayo Saka! You're like, what the players we got? It's in the bag, mate. He's coming home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope it is. I've kept oh. you for 58 minutes. Uh, That's is all right. There, Might as well round up to an hour if you want. Well, you're a busy man. Is there anything else you want to plug that people can catch you on? Um... Uh, my um, so I do uh, the as you very kindly earlier gave a very juicy plug to the comedians playing fantasy Premier League podcast, which is myself and John Richardson battling out every week. There's an element of fantasy Premier League to it, but if you don't play FPL, really, it, most of it is us two um, taking the mick out of each other. And um, I have my show, The Political Party, which is recorded every fortnight in London at the Duchess Theatre, and uh, I had David Dimbleby on last night. Mm the veteran uh, question time and election night presenter. He's 84. Right. And I've been doing that show for eight years. The first guest that has ever flicked the middle middle finger at me. (laughs) Mid-interview. I was trying to get him to tell me who he votes for. So I was trying (laughs) to narrow it down. And he said, he votes in every election. I said, have you voted for different parties? He said, yeah. So I said, if there was... at the next election, would you keep your vote the same as it was last time? So I was trying to like figure out by yeah. you know, almost like doing guess who who you voted for without saying Labour or Conservative. And then he went on this prolonged, he was obviously very frustrated 
that um you know, he said, you know, the promises were made in Brexit and it basically still hasn't been delivered. It went on this long thing. So it was like a five minute exposition of, you know, the, just the sheer incompetence at the top of the British government. So I said, uh, so you voted remain then. And, he just went like that. <laughs> and then he said, actually, in our family, we do this. And he, and he wheeled it up to me. It's a, a, a real experience. So, yes, that's every fortnight. And forthcoming guests include Eddie Izzard, uh, Emily Maitlis, and John Sopel, Rachel Reeves. And then um, I'll be on tour again next year at some point. Come and do the Nottingham Glee. What else is that? I feel like there's something else I should be plugging. I've always got something to flog. You know what? I'll tell you what. I, I mean, this is completely irrelevant. My birthday the other day, right? And a mate of mine got me an amazing... And I can't believe I didn't know this. He said, you probably already got this. I mean, I just unwrapped it last night. So it's this. Oh, wow. Oh, Forest Ipswich, yeah, sixth November, nineteen eighty-two. Forest played on the day I was born, and he got me the program. I didn't know. I didn't know that they played on the actual day. I was Is that like, Gary on the front? Know that? Yeah, it's got it's Gary Bertels little. on the front. Yeah, yeah, get him to sign it for you. Yeah. Do you know what? I should I should get him to sign it, shouldn't I? And you should do, yeah. And then get it framed. I can't believe... Do you know what? I felt like such a fool. I was like, how did I not know that they played on the actual day? Have I never Googled that myself? Did Forrest play on the day you were born? Uh, my, I was born a couple of months. I'm a bit older than you by a few Are months. You? So, yeah. You're, you're, you're five years forward. younger. What's your secret? <laughs> oh, delighting. I thought you were like 20-odd. No, I'm 40. No I'm way. July 82. Oh so they didn't God. play when I was born, unless Cluffy had them on some pre-season tour or something. Probably did. Yeah. Oh, I'm November 82. I just presumed you were like early 30s. No. Matt, That's you've got time. whatever you're doing. You've got like Mediterranean heritage or Italian, <laughs> Irish? <laughs> Definitely not. What? Definitely not. My kids can get an not. Irish passport because my wife is, uh, she was born in Dublin. So, okay. to an Irish mum uh, who is half Flemish, this is complicated. Okay. But so they've got a bit of, you know, yeah. international heritage. But I think my, my family's just uh, sourced from Market Drayton and South Shropshire, if anyone knows <laughs> their geography well enough for that. Oh, the famous Market Drayton. Sounds a bit like Mediterranean. Market Drayton. <laughs> there's, uh... there's a Muller yogurt factory there. That's <laughs> continental. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't far off. <laughs> <laughs> well, belated happy birthday for July. Yeah, and to you for November. Cheers, yeah, yeah. Forty. I don't know. Well, yeah, I'm going. I'm going on now. But That's forty right. doesn't mean anything to me. It was just another, another birthday. I don't know if you had some kind of meltdown or not, but I was fine. No, the only thing I, I, I did think was seeing it written down. Because you obviously get birthday cards with forty written on it. And you go, God, how I am a grown. Obviously, there's various points in your life at which you're told you're now an adult. Hmm. I remember going up to like year six at primary school and the headmaster going, you're young adults now. and thinking, I don't feel like it. And then at 18, I was like, I'm going to feel like a man. And I didn't. And then at like 21, just because that used to be a deal. And then at 30, I think I thought, oh, crikey. Yeah. I mean, seeing 40 written down, I, was like, I don't feel 40 at all. No. Mainly because I just feel so immature. I mean, physically, I, I look older, but inside of my, I feel like an idiot. I, I can't be 40. Yeah. So it was more that, really. But I didn't have any, like, oh, God, I'm going to have to, like, do certain, you know, people, I think some people have, like, I've got to do this by 30, this by 40, whatever. I never had any of that. I never had, like, all oh, right, well, now I must buy a lawnmower <laughs> or you know i don't know <laughs> what, what, what is being a, an adult in in modern britain but um yeah i didn't set myself any it's not like i thought oh or oh my life's over in a way i thought not bad to reach 40 do you know what i mean uh, yeah i thought that yeah i mean i did have cancer when i was 36 so i do feel a lot more aware of my own mortality but yeah um yeah I mean, I'm going on, not tomorrow, Thursday, I'm going to London to meet my best friend from uni. And that was 20 years ago we were living together, and it feels like yesterday. Oh, man. Isn't that weird? So, yeah, time does go fast, doesn't it? Where are you going in London? Ah, um, he's messaged me this morning. There's some kind of immersive VR experience, so we're going to 
go into that and it's like a oh wow what the stranger zomb- things thing it's like a zombie thing or a what? first person halo shooter or shoots or something what the f- that sounds amazing we're giving a free advert for it now it's called other world where's that at? it's somewhere near victoria station i think it's 44 legit? quid so it is quite pricey i'm meeting him at victoria station and i think yeah he's booked it for 7 30 oh that'd be great Market Halls, Victoria, we'll get some food. I don't know London. I don't really like London that much, but obviously you live there. It's um, great. It's not as good as Nottingham, obviously, but... I find it too busy. Yeah. But uh, that's like its strength and its weakness, isn't it? You get off the train in London, you're like, oh, there's loads of stuff happening. And then within a minute, you're like, there's too much stuff happening. <laughs> yeah. That's just like that fine line between, oh, wow, loads of people and fucking hell, loads of people, you know. I know, there's too many. My <laughs> brother went to a network event at Twickenham. Uh, and he sent me a video. Full stadium. Some, no, some ex-rugby players were involved speaking at one of these business events where they make up some nonsense about how, you know, they're delighted to be here. It's all part of teamwork, not the fact I'm getting paid five grand to be here. <laughs> and he sent me the video and I'm like, mate, this is my worst nightmare. I, I sit at home on my own all day working, you know, doing stuff like this is great. But yeah. if I had to be in a room with strangers, I'd absolutely dread it. Nothing worse. I think you'd be... But you're a very impressive man. You'd be great. You're talking about Forrest. <laughs> Darren Fletcher wants to do one of these live in a couple great of weeks. Idea. We might do it. That's a really a good crowd, idea. A big crowd. Well, big. Like 400. I mean, obviously, yeah, you brilliant. do this for 10,000 or not 10,000. Yeah, whatever the biggest audience you do it to. Oh, is, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's great fun. Is Where it? would you do it in Nottingham? Uh, bar, Trent Nav, maybe. That's yeah, one of the... Great. Yeah, yeah, outside under that big. What have they done at the Trent Nav, by the way? It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, well, we there's might do it there. Out there, there used to just be nothing out there, and now there's this like. It looks like they've created a barn, and knocked the side off, and just created this mad zone. It's great. Yeah, I love it out we, there. We might do a live one of these. We'll see. A couple of weeks after this comes out, if we don't, just ignore. Everyone's listening to this, and we don't do it. Forget I ever said any of this. We I'm might sure do, it do it in at summer. some point, though, wouldn't you? Yeah, we will. It's, yeah, it be yeah, lots of <laughs> blow iron trumpets. Enough people yeah. listen to it now that it's worth doing. So, and, and without thing. being crude, it's a good way to monetize a podcast, as they would say in the industry. As they would say in the industry. Unfortunately, in the I work industry. for a company, so I don't see any of the. If you were, if you were, at, uh, if you were, at, uh... oh no! But if you're selling tickets, we well, might have to cut this out. But if you're selling tickets to an event, you want a slice of the. You know, you send ticket sales on the back of your hosting, aren't you? More the panel, Fletch and Gary, I think, <laughs> would be there. Mm, I would think. No, I think it's the whole thing. This is your I, show. Hundred yeah. percent. Don't cut yourself out of the finances. Yeah. I mean, I probably should edit this out, but I might not. Just so my boss. <laughs> <laughs> you should absolutely. If you're putting on a live event that you are involved in, and you are on the stage, you absolutely, if you're selling tickets, need to be paid for that on top of. That's extra income, isn't it? That you generated. True. Absolutely. I should end this. I need to get back. I'll to be my your office. agent. I'll be your agent. Good. I need to. I've got yeah. an actual day job that isn't this podcast, although it's within the same company. So I should get back to my not so exciting day job. Really. Um, thanks to everyone who's watched along and done uh, joined us for this. Very in much, very much enjoyed it. Uh, got another interview next week. An exciting one that's confirmed, but touch wood, I won't say in case it falls through, but we'll be doing these throughout the World Cup. Matt, thank you very much for so much of your time and hour and ten Always minutes. a pleasure. We shall hopefully have you back on at the end of the season talking about survival. That's the plan. Forest stay up and England win the World Cup. Yes, I'm not going to ask you to choose one. I did think earlier, so I asked him to choose one, but that's too cruel, so I won't. Oh, Forest, so. Forest over England every time. Good, that's what I would have said as well. Yeah, but. God, yeah, but but, you know, England winning the World Cup would be... Oh, what a party we'd all have. True, true. Right, we shall leave nice there. Job. Back this time next week. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good week, and we shall see you soon. <laughs>